Live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker. K Grow in the morning show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey everybody, how you doing today? It is uh, April 25th, Wednesday, April 25th, 2018, and a little flustered today. Just trying to get things back on track and started, and I think we got anything back on our timeline anyway. Late for school today, everybody was, and so everybody got a ride to the bus stop today, and that throws things off, and you know, that's it. Uh, And now, sorry Donald Trump, you can't be president anymore. It's not so bad. You see, it comes out even in the end. It is Wednesday. Uh, Greg Dworkin and Joan McCarter will be here with us to keep us back, uh, get us back on track with the news. And it's a good thing, too. Not a moment too soon, as we were spinning off uh, into uh, strange territory. Well, every day, I guess that happens while Donald Trump is president. But uh, interesting show yesterday. We'll be back on track today and none too soon either, by the way. Thanks to Bill in Portland, Maine, who starts us off as he does each day with a morning tweet. Daily Coast Radio is live today. Today, KGROX, that's me and how you can reach me on Twitter during the show. KGROX flicks dandruff off the shoulders of guests Greg Dworkin and Joan McCarter to demonstrate his alpha male status in the wilds of radio land. Yeah, I did see some an interesting... Uh, Interesting analysis of what was going on yesterday with the French president in town. He claims, by the way, not to have stayed overnight in the United States. We'll see whether or not uh, his flight records bear that out. But I did see somebody saying that he was, you know, essentially exhibiting primate grooming behavior yesterday. (laughs) And uh, that's pretty, pretty wild just even to uh, have to contemplate. That's not even, that's like very disturbing to have to think of it. And, and it turns out the Gorilla Channel didn't even really a real thing. But yeah, leading Emmanuel Macron around by the hand and brushing, dan- what was that? Brushing dandruff off of his shoulders during a photo op, like I'm going to humiliate you in some way. I don't know. And Macron probably didn't care one way or another. So hopefully that rolls off his, his back. But not that far removed from his hand grabbing during handshakes and uh, 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 trying to intimidate the recipient of those handshakes. And, of course, word got out pretty quickly about that one, and he, he dropped that tactic. Do you remember that? He used to do that all the time, and I don't see that very much. Speaking of hand holding and hand grabbing, there was some video making the rounds yesterday of Trump making a really weird and awkward attempt to hold Melania Trump's hand, I guess, during the initial reception of maybe the uh, French first couple, or I don't know, there was some sort of photo op going on. And I don't don't know what they were doing. It didn't matter, but they they weren't going to tell me what was going on because they were too busy zooming in on the hands. And uh, Trump has a weird little move there where, I guess, where he thinks there ought to be hand holding in public, he you know, opts to uh, try and initiate that. But uh, I I guess things are a little icy between him and Melania right now, given the probably the Stormy Daniels affair and uh, probably, you know, to some extent, the fact that he's a horrible, horrible person and a horrible, horrible president. uh, That's probably somewhat disturbing to Melania, uh, who, you know, in, in at bottom, uh, is an immigrant to the United States and probably has very deep feelings about uh, what the United States represents and how its president should conduct himself. And all of that is just not happening and probably undermining her whole view of what America is, can be, ought to be, etc. And uh, her only joy in life is the knowledge that Donald Trump will very likely die before her and hopefully soon. I don't mind saying that. It's not illegal to say so. It's my First Amendment right. And uh, though you shouldn't wish ill on others, uh, I say there's an exception for Donald Trump. Anyway, we can examine that from a legal perspective today and in the days to come. Some important court cases pending before us. Uh, We won't necessarily 
spend a great deal of time on that as a focus today. But at some point, perhaps later in the week, Armando might want to weigh in on those things. I did see an interesting uh, tweet referring to an interesting article about a subject we brought up the other day with respect to the legal proceedings, deference to the president and whether or not President Trump's tweets or other words, uh, however delivered, ought to weigh against him in consideration of his administration's positions before the courts. And, uh, well, I, I, I say I say yes. And uh, a qualified yes from some legal scholars that uh, we've been following and discussing on Twitter. Perhaps we can fit that in at some point today. I don't see any real problem with distinguishing between the way Donald Trump puts himself on the record and the way every other president in history has put himself on the record. So uh, it's pretty easy to see with the naked eye. I don't think you have to be a trained legal mind to figure out that there's a considerable difference and that they ought to be treated differently. All right. Well, Greg Dworkin is here all the way from Connecticut, though you can't tell that because he's calling by Skype. So it sounds like he's in the room and that's the miracle of technology. Good morning, Greg. How you doing? Hey, good morning. How are you? Uh, you know, I'm okay. I was late for the bus. Oh, well. But, uh, you know, uh, luckily that wasn't missing the bus. That's just got to drive to the bus, which defeats the whole point of mass transportation, but whatever. Huh. I'm uh, reading about really this uh, recent Harry Reid um, interview. Oh. I guess he gave with Heidi uh, Prespola. How's his eye doing, they say? Uh, well, the picture of him doesn't have a patch over his All eye. All right, so that's good. He says the R is the limpest waffle you've ever seen. That's a classic Harry Reid quote. <laughs> the, 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 I'm sorry. I don't think I got my head around that. What? I heard a waffle in there. Something the limpest like waffle. I guess if you don't burn them, you know, they're kind of soft. <sighs> what? So what's the yeah. limpest waffle? Republicans. Repo oh, okay. I'm like, you know, he's, uh, he's complaining about the fact they didn't really uh, help them uh, preserve okay. democracy and save I America. See. I had a had context the problem. You said patch over his eye, and then you you called Republicans R's, and I'm like, is this a pirate joke? What's the Arr. waffle thing? <laughs> I don't – pirate waffles, I don't know. doesn't make any sense. But uh, I'm with you now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, a little slow on the uptake. Right. So uh, Reed says, listen, we've been through impeachment, and they're not pleasant. The less we talk about impeachment, the better off we are. I agree with him. Okay. Stop talking impeachment, about impeachment. it. Just start doing your investigations. All right, get, yeah. Get the evidence together. Stop talking about it. That's fair game. That's a good compromise. I'm not thinking about that thing. I am simply I investigating. I am. I just want to do investigations, you know. and the data goes where the data goes. That's right. All. It's not my fault if it turns out that you know he did horrible things. I just uh, uh, When I find it out, I'll figure out what to do about it. It's Reed probably, said that uh, Trump's former FBI director James Comey and the billionaire Koch brothers are all to blame for the fact that Americans didn't learn earlier about Russian attempts to influence the U.S. election. And he singled out, out Senate Republicans for not doing more. My colleagues were afraid. They were afraid of Trump. They were afraid of Comey, the FBI. In October of that year, Reid sent a letter to Comey blaming him, blasting him for withholding explosive information yes. about Trump and Russia. Right. Even as the FBI chief held a press conference about Hillary Clinton's emails. Oh, yes. And then he says, uh, now, well, you know, I was right. Well, that's that's true. He and he said the Republicans right. remain afraid of the Koch brothers, whose political network spends millions supporting GOP candidates. Upon leaving the Senate, <clears throat> Reid said he approached a GOP colleague to ask why he hadn't helped him try to get more public information on Russia meddling. The Republican said, because I was afraid the Kochs would go after me. Oh. Well, that's, that's nice. That's a profile and courage. So the idea was that they, that Republicans at the time believed that Russia was meddling and that the Kochs were involved in that meddling and had an interest in it. Well, the, that the uh, Russians were meddling. He didn't say that the Kochs were fine with that and wanted it. He just got the uh, answer that if they didn't toe the line because uh, of, of uh, prevent, you know, because if you said something and you actually prevented the Republicans from winning because of it, then the Koch brothers would have a loss. Yes. And so they so, were more concerned about the Republican win than they were about the Russian meddling, but they just didn't want anything that would interfere with a Republican win. I see. So that's only evidence of collusion and nothing to worry about. Exactly. So uh, most interesting, maybe, from a process point of view, mm -hmm. Reid also said he believes the Senate's irreparably damaged and it's eventually going to be the House. Okay. That's all right. We knew Is that it? was the case. 
Yeah, uh, that's not good, though. No, well, it, it, it's not great, but uh, it's, uh, it, it is what it is. It's been on that path for a long time. Uh, the yes, it's Senate not new. Is, it's just no. the disappointing. Yeah, well, there were lots of people who warned, well, we don't want that to happen, but I don't know that there's any not having it happen, for one thing. Right. I mean, we, we changed the, the founder's design a long time ago when we went to direct election of senators, and I'm cool with it. So I'm watching a beautiful uh, gif of a gif of a of a, a what? wave, a wave, a you know, wave. one of these little uh, quickie movie little things. It's a wav. Is that and uh, the, that's a good lead in to uh, yesterday's um, election results, which I want to talk about a little bit. Those. Yes. All right. G. Elliott Morris, the results in tonight's special elections reinforce projections of a large Democratic wave in November, perhaps even push boundary of expectations a tad to the left. The swing toward Democrats in Arizona 08 could very well exceed 20 points. Mm -hmm. A very bad night for the GOP. It didn't exceed 20 points. I think it went from uh, 21 Trump to uh, plus five for the eventual Republican winner. But that is a very solidly... Republican district with older voters, everything that you would expect, and, and a relatively high turnout, everything that you would expect would aid the Republican. In fact, one statistic I read suggested that the early vote was two to one Republican, yet the Republican candidate only got 53% of that vote. Hmm. Oh. That means a lot of Republicans are persuadable and they could be persuaded to vote for the Democrat and did. And so that's a large swing in favor of the Democrats, greater than the average, which has been around 13 points. And G. Elliott Morris, who tweets the uh, uh, the, the results here, uh, really suggests it was a pretty good day for the Democrats yesterday. J. Miles Coleman, writing at Decision Desk headquarters, notes well, the uh, today. that the, the, the same thing is true. Let's just uh, fix my Skype here so I can see it. Oh, Skype. 2016, Clinton lost Arizona 8 by 21. Tonight, Harold Tipperney, Democrat, is only losing by 6. Actually turned out to be 5 point something. 5.2, 5.3. Roughly a third of the district, 46 of 142 precincts, crossed over to the Democrat hmm. from Trump. All right. And no Hillary Clinton precincts went to Lesko, the eventual winner. Okay. Well, that's good. Nice to have held those. Okay. In Arizona, 08, David Byler at Weekly Standard writes, uh, I just want to give you an idea, this is not, uh, you know, partisan uh, slanting. In Arizona, 08, ours had a lot of advantages they didn't have elsewhere. They had not a ton of de-ancestry. That is to say, that is a Republican district and has been, as we say, in Brooklyn forever. I see. Candidates are more evenly matched than Pennsylvania, 18, as far as I can tell. The governor didn't play a brownback-like role here, thinking back to Kansas 4, where people voted against the governor. There was a high turnout. And so, therefore, these numbers are not good for Republicans. Okay. Dave, Dave Wasserman. To win the House, Democrats need to average overperform about 4% compared to their Cook Political uh, uh, Partisan Voter Index. And here's the overperformance in the past eight specials. You have to do four to get the House. Kansas 04-12. Uh, Montana at large eight, Georgia six, six, South Carolina five was seven, Utah three was six, Alabama senator was 15, Pennsylvania 18 was 11, and Arizona 08 was 11. So overperformance is different than swing. Overperformance is being compared to the PBI, and that's generally based on several elections, whereas swing is what did Trump do compared to where you are now. Yeah. So if you discard Alabama senator as a special case, Democrat House overperformances have been remarkably consistent, all in the 6 to 12 range. And uh, the thing is, what's the PVI of the next special? It's Ohio 12, and it's an R plus 7. So that could be a pickup for the Democrats if the average holds. And uh, also, another thing that Wasserman noted is that if you're looking at the number of districts that are less Republican – in Arizona 08, it's like most of them. Hmm. All right, I get you. Yeah, that was a lot of numbers there, but uh, essentially, just a long story short for that one, a, a Democratic plus uh, a performance of four points better than average leads on the whole to a Democratic takeover of the House, and in none of the special elections has it been lower than six. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, okay. they're running six to 11. 
Very good. So Josh Barrow asks a very good question. Josh Barrow says, I'm still confused by the combination of a very, very dire special election result and getting more dire for Republicans, he means, with a generic ballot track that doesn't look all that dire. Hmm. Okay. Okay. And Jared Walsack, who uh, I don't know, but is senior policy analyst at the Tax Foundation. Okay. So I'm thinking not necessarily... Uh, you know, a, a partisan Democrat. Not, it's like not thumb necessarily. Tax or, oh, income right. tax. Okay. Right. Right. Uh, says the following voter intensity, which matters the most in special elections. Intensity. Somewhat less in midterms. Yeah, uh, you ready? You uh, know, enthusiasm? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I no, thought he was going to use intensity, and I was like, oh, well, that's you weren't kinda... ready. See? Well, Curveball you. Yeah, I figured there's no point in being ready now, but okay, is he going to get to enthusiasm? I'll be ready. Well, intensity, enthusiasm. Voter intensity, oh, okay. which matters the most. Enthusiasm. There you go. It doesn't really work. I don't know. Okay. Somewhat less in midterms and the least in presidential elections. Historically, Republicans have better off fear turnout, and polls probably reflect that, arguably under-adjusted. Very questionable assumption right now. So it's also easier to nationalize a special election National coverage, wow. high spend, think uh, Georgia 6, for example, or Pennsylvania 18. And nationalizing a congressional race can't work in Republicans' favor right now. If the midterms held today, Republican mm-hmm. losses likely worse than a generic ballot, but not as bad as special elections. Things do tend to even out across the country in all sorts of different districts. But the idea that somehow or other Democrats aren't maintaining their – ready? Enthusiasm. Mm-hmm. Enthusiasms. Uh, you know, it's not true. So far, they are. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's. that's a, Thank you, God. I don't know. We use all that sound effects. <laughs> that's what I like. Anything we can use. <laughs> that was a good combo. All right. So, uh, what does that all mean? You know, it, mm. it's all good news. Now, let me talk a little bit about New York because New York had eleven elections yesterday. Okay. I think. Oh, oh. And, and most of them showed up, you know, just the way you'd expect. But there was one magic one for me. Oh, good. And that was the state senate uh, district thirty-seven. SD 37, which happens to cover Yonkers, where I grew up, All right. and northern uh, areas uh, going up to Rye along the coast. Now, this district is uh, recently redrawn, and it was basically redrawn to be almost a 50-50 district. Hmm. All right. Uh, it's extremely white, for example. Wow. And uh, it isn't just white. It's like Macomb County, uh, Michigan white. Oh. I mean, when I was growing up, it was all ethnic. It was all, you know, Irish, Polish, Italian. And, you know, uh, if if a Jewish guy wanted to run for, for, you know, a congressional seat or something like that, Mm -hmm. a state seat, you basically had to be captain of the football team or you had no chance. I see. Yeah, well, okay. Now, that that was 50 years ago. Things have changed a little bit since then. But it's basically an even district. And uh, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, the case that the Democrats are going to walk away with it, but... Yesterday, Shaley Mayer, my high school classmate, oh. moved from the Assembly to the State Senate uh, and won by 16 points. It was just a, a hard-fought but easy victory. Okay. And well, that was not expected to be that much of a blowout. No. And All also, right. uh, in the Assembly, they flipped another seat in, I think, in uh, Suffolk County in, in Long Island. I think uh, that was a seat that hadn't gone Democrat since 1978. Oh. So the local results were pretty good as well. I mean, there's everything that's going on locally and in the uh, state legislatures, just like in Virginia. Um, there's going to be Democratic pickups there as well, and it's not just going to be national. So. If you were looking for evidence that the, the blue wave is cresting or not as big as you thought, and you're not going to find it from yesterday's results. Okay. Well, then let's surf on, I suppose. Yeah, the, the New York uh, – is it 11 races? Are they all special elections, 11 of them? I, I, I hadn't followed all of them. Yeah, I, I really was not uh, the day This on one, that. the one, uh, SD37 – uh, happened because the Democrats stepped down to be a county executive. I see. So the seat opened up. I wasn't following all the other ones as closely. I don't know what happened in all of them and why they were having elections. But there you have it. And uh, so they, they did flip one in the assembly. And uh, by making that seat Democratic, 
the state Senate came very, very close mm -hmm. to being able to flip the state Senate from Republican to Democrat, except it didn't quite happen uh -huh. because it's New York. Well, yeah, New York, the New York, the state Senate in particular is just so baffling. It's bafflingly weird. Yeah, so that... you have this Democrat from Brooklyn. Yes. Right. And uh, his name know, is Simcha Felder. Uh, okay. Simcha Felder <laughs> sticks with the Republicans. Yeah. Uh, claiming that, you know, it would be disruptive to his district if he switched parties back. I mean, he's a Democrat that caucuses with the Republicans. He's not a Republican. Yeah. But it would be um, bad for his district if uh, suddenly the allegiance switched so close to November. So he's just going to wait it out. I see. Everybody assumes that means that the Republicans, therefore, are buying him off with all sorts of stuff for his district. I guess. That's how politics works everywhere, but certainly that's how it works in New York. Yes. Uh, well, that's a very popular plan in most places, buying people off uh, common and effective. Now, interestingly, if Felder had gone back to the Democrats, mm -hmm. I think the Democrats would have uh, controlled the Senate in theory by one vote. Right. I mean, right now they're down by one vote because he's on the other side. Yeah. But – uh -huh. I think there's this New York provision law that says, no, 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 you need like 38 votes to change who's in charge. It isn't just okay. enough to have a simple majority. And the reason that is is because we decided, and there's no good reason, but that's the way it is. Ah. So there would have been a lot of lawsuits about that. Uh, I would have been able to fix that for them. But, uh, yeah, it's, it wouldn't have been – there's a game probably not worth the candle. A, a Senate, a New York State Senate – uh, that flips control by one seat when it was in the other party's hands because of a non-party switcher who caucuses with them. You would never know who had a working majority. Exactly. Day. But uh, Senate rules require a supermajority of 38 votes to change leadership. That's okay. I can fix supermajority. And the Democrats say, oh, that's not true. They can do it with a simple majority. Right. And the Republicans say, no, you can't. Okay. And so that, that was going to be a fight, but now it's not a fight because this Brooklyn guy decided to stick with the Republicans for now. All right. Good yeah. idea, dummy. I mean, I don't want you, to be honest. But So basically what it means is nothing's going to get done. All right. <laughs> At well, least from now until November. That's okay. There's 25 that's... days left, and with this kind of uh, razor-thin majority, not a lot gets done. Yeah. I like it. It's pretty yeah. good for the gubernatorial race. Yeah, exactly. Now, um, so uh, the gubernatorial race, you know, there's this uh, primary. I do. And I Cuomo and Cynthia one. Nixon. And the weird thing is, of course, Cuomo is certainly not my favorite Democrat by any stretch of the imagination. One can look at Cuomo and say, well, having him primary kind of pushes him to be a better governor you know, in the days that he has. He's, he's likely uh, to win. He's, but he hasn't done things. a lot to improve, uh, for example, voting registration in New York, making it easier. No. Uh, he's only recently tried to rein in the breakaway Dems who worry, who were uh, uh, caucusing with the Republicans, the so-called IDC. There was eight of those. Um, and, and I'm not going to get into the Byzantine politics of uh, Albany, uh, New York mm -hmm. Assembly and Senate politics. It's just it's it's one of those things where unless you're a scholar, it's almost too difficult to follow. But uh, what. Cuomo did is he forced his conservative Democratic allies in the IDC to break away from the Republicans and go back to the Democrats, making mm -hmm. this a razor thin margin. And he only did that because he's being primaried and he's up for reelection. Well, that's an OK reason. I mean, you evaluate it appropriately, but uh, I, pressure works and it's supposed to. And if, if it didn't, you would have a problem. Right. Uh, national? What's going on nationally? Well, it's the Ronnie Jackson show. Oh, Yay. yes. That was a big story yesterday, and uh, we missed still having on. you on to, to talk about it. So let's – yeah. Well, it's still on, and it's getting bigger and because that's what scandals do. And uh, right. this is so crazy. Ronnie, Ronnie Jackson, who is somebody who is completely unqualified to be head of the VA. Yes. And Trump therefore nominates him. Right. Right. I guess his own personal doctor was unavailable. I guess so. Or he forgot what his name was. I don't yeah, think he has a close relationship with him. 
So Roddy Jackson says nice the things hair. about Trump, and all of a sudden Trump says, hey, you said nice things about me. You even lied about my weight. I think you should be the head of the VA. Yes. You're oh, an you admiral. know what it was? Uh, his doctor You're an admiral. Look you like. must uh, – I, I think I'll put you at the defense. Yeah. He looks like – he like looks like he's supposed to be there, and yeah, his doctor And that's doesn't. generally what he goes by. If you look like mm-hmm. the part mm-hmm. and right. you've uh, said something nice about me, you're in. Central casting. Right. So as Mark Murray points out, if cabinet secretary picks aren't being vetted by the White House, what else isn't getting vetted? Everything. We're betting on Ronnie Jackson, no formal interview, no process, and... Yeah. Whoop. And what? Uh, no process and... I would... Now I don't hear you. You probably pressed the button to Skype. What about you? I hear you now. No, you didn't okay. do anything different. It wasn't it, me. I didn't do anything. Sunspots then. Sunspots. Yes. So uh, what did what did uh, Roddy Jackson do? Well, I he got know. drunk on the job. That is amazing. He was traveling overseas with the president just in case something goes wrong with the president's health, and he was drinking. That's not good. <laughs> and uh, was pounding on the door of a of a female staffer to the point where the Secret Service had intervened because they were afraid what that he might wake up the president. Oh, about. <laughs> what happens with the female staff is your problem. But you know, we yeah. can't have you wake up the president, so right. we're going to have to uh, intervene here. You need to harass less. So we noisily. get you some coffee. So, uh, you know, why are these things all coming out? There was an Inspector General report. Yes. In 2012, about this. Why do we know about the Inspector General I report? I don't know. Because the White House released it in support of Ronnie Jackson. But that doesn't make sense. I, they release it in support of Ronnie Jackson. Yeah, why would they release that? I don't know. What I don't know do? either. I, I, as I understand it, the, the report calls for I, – maybe they read half of it. I don't know. It calls for the removal of Jackson and or the guy who used to be Obama's doctor. And I guess they thought, see, something, Obama. I don't know. Obama was mentioned, so they released it. I, I, I don't know. We'll be back after this. I'm going to go drink. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for KGO in the Morning, interrupting this little break to say thanks so much to all of you who are contributing supporters of KGO in the Morning. Thousands of you are downloading the show each day, but fewer than 1 in 25 regular listeners are donating to help keep us on the air. For the money you'd spend on a single three-minute iTunes song, we bring you two hours of great news and entertainment every day, five days a week. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it easy. You can find us there by searching KGRO X or David Waldman or KGRO in the Morning or even Daily Coast Radio in their search box, and you'll be right where you need to be to make easy, recurring, monthly contributions to support our show. Once again, thanks so much for your support. Welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Greg Dworkin still with us, uh, ready to discuss uh, Ronnie Jackson. Unless unless you need a break for a drink, we should just go right into this. Uh, I I really think that's inappropriate. I think we should do drugs instead. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I know where we can get some. Well, yeah, John Boehner. Uh, oh, well, yes, that's true. He's lobbying for them. I was just going to tell it's all Ronnie good now, Jackson you know, I had a headache. Yeah, remember, marijuana is good now. All right. Well, right. it was it bad still yesterday, smells, but it's good but, now. Okay. So uh, this Washington Post story points out in Jackson's case, the nomination was already facing scrutiny from veterans groups and lawmakers who questioned his management experience, his views in outsourcing VA services, and his glowing description of Trump's health during a ja- January news briefing. That was then weird. came accusations that Jackson had contributed to a hostile work environment, bad. had been seen drinking excessively on official trips, bad. and had improperly dispensed medications to White House staff members, which I believe were sleeping pills for plane trips, and they were calling him the candy man because of that. <laughs> okay. Right? Well, when allegations of professional misconduct by White House physician Ronnie Jackson started trickling during the past week to the Senate committee, mm. considering his nomination to lead the Department of Veterans Affairs, its chairman, Senny, Senator Johnny Isaacson, mm. called the White House twice seeking information, didn't get answers that satisfied him, and it was all about you know the vetting process. So uh, as I was saying to David off the air, you know, uh, Trump vets his cabinet members about as easily and well as he vets his pardons. Yep, uh, all all. It looks good. The therefore, TV. I'm going to do it. Right, now, farm to table, TV to law. 
let's talk a little bit of doctor stuff about uh, Ronnie Jackson. It's kind of interesting. All right. Um, so if you're a physician, basically you have to be licensed. And generally the people who license you are the state in which you work. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. And if you therefore have complaints about somebody's personal misconduct, you would make it to that state agency normally. Okay. But he works for the feds. Right. Which is stateless. Sort of, yes. His license is from Virginia. Okay. How do I know? You could look it up. Oh. You can go to Virginia Department of Health Damn and it. most state departments of health and type in the doctor's name and say, does this guy have a license here? Yeah. And that's done for consumers and patients so that like, if some guy claims to be a doctor in your state, you can look up and say, is he licensed? Right. So he's right, not yeah. licensed in Maryland. He's not licensed in D.C. He is licensed in uh, Virginia. And by the way, his license will be up at the end of May. So he's probably going to have to renew that. Oh. But there's this deal with the federal government that if you are licensed in a state, but then you're working for the federal government doing federal government things, then you're granted reciprocity. Basically, there's no federal government license that you have to apply for with a federal government body that overlooks this okay. kind of thing. Which makes a lot of sense because if you're in the military and you move around a lot. Oh, yeah. How do you be a military doctor who's here and there and, you know, can you practice in this state and that state? And what about if you go overseas and so on and so forth? So it's just one of those little side light uh, process things, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. So have there been complaints about Ronnie Jackson? You'd actually have to go to Virginia to find that out. OK, I'm here. Yeah. Well, you, you can always make a uh, inquiry into the Department of Health okay. from the state that you live in and, and find that out. Uh, so I didn't know that until I looked that up huh. yesterday. But oh, that's where his license is from. Excellent. Not and really. uh, if you put up, if you plug his name into some of these other uh, surrounding states, sometimes people have two licenses, sometimes three, rarely that many, but sometimes. And the reason is that each license for a physician from a different state, uh, you have to show there's some reason why you, you do that. If you live here, but you have an office across the border in another state, like I'm right near the New York state border, mm. uh, or I have a license in New York state before I moved to Connecticut, you could keep two licenses, but it's phenomenally expensive oh and there's also requirements that you have to do for each state which are different well you know medicine is different a, everywhere. A continuing education courses about the opioid crisis or Let's child see. abuse or something uh, that you show every couple of years that you've done this in order to keep your license it's it's uh, burdensome enough so that people don't generally uh, choose to keep more than one license unless there's some uh professional reason for you to do that okay so uh, it's not surprising that he only has license from Virginia, even though, you know, Maryland, Bethesda, you know, you'd think maybe he might, uh, but maybe. that's the situation there. And the uh, what happens if you actually make a complaint against the physician? Well, that goes to the State Department of Health, and there's generally a board that looks into that, and that could take months. It's sometimes secret, and it's often difficult to find out what the results are. Okay. One thing they're much better about and that's because states have been passing state by state laws only over the last couple of years is opioid prescriptions. Hmm. Yes. Uh, for example, it's not unusual here in Connecticut. What you have to do is uh, if it, 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 I don't do this as part of my regular practice, uh, you know, lung docs don't generally give out the opioids to kids uh, who have lung that. issues. You know, it's not an asthma drug. But uh, if somebody was asking for uh, or you thought that you needed to prescribe a few days of an opioid, hmm. you're supposed to go and check that out at the state central repository of information and look up that patient. A lot of states do this. I see. And make sure that that person isn't requesting opioid prescriptions from like 19 different doctors. Right. Okay. That's your responsibility as the doctor do before you prescribe it. I figured something like that was going on because it takes 20 minutes to get Claritin now. But the point is that that's all set up so that the doctor can check you out, the yeah. patient. It's not set up so that the patient can ah. check you out, the doctor. Like, are you a candy man or not? Exactly. That's really not what that whole thing is about. Maybe we could put that on the internet and you could ask around. Where can yeah, I get well, opioids easy? I bet you know, that's it's probably on Reddit, but you can't find it out yeah. in your State Department of yep. Health. So, you know, it's it's if you want to find out if somebody has a history mm -hmm. because you read it in the newspaper, it's it's actually relatively difficult to find that out. All right. Well, but if you if you read in the newspaper that, that this particular doctor has a history of uh, dispensing inappropriate medications, um, it's hard to know. 
Uh, yeah, hard. So you can't fact check. So good. Let's write books about it. It's hard to know. Uh, so hmm. then what happens is that if somebody makes a complaint about that, then it goes to the state board, and the state board will take their time, and then they'll decide something. Right. When no one's complaining about him, they were happy to get Ambien. But if nobody's complaining, you're not going to know that there's a problem. Ah. So, you know, it's, it's, you're it's really difficult to put this into context and say, well, how come everybody didn't know about this? Well, uh, how? The president's a dotard. That's why. I mean, <laughs> the president could find this out. I, I, it's difficult it, for you and me, but the president but to can be say fair and nonpartisan. It yeah. raises the next question. Well, what was he doing during the Obama administration? That is a good question. Uh, and the answer is, I don't know, and I don't even know either. how you find out. I yeah, I I know he wasn't Obama's physician until about 2013, mm -hmm. but you know, three years or so is a good long time to be somebody's doctor. Although, I, I have some questions about whether or not. Like what the what the real relationship is between the president and this White House physician. The White House physician is always there and gives, I guess, the president an annual physical and makes some sort of report. But I don't know whether the, the presidents also say, yeah, but for for real now, I want to see my doctor. And uh, well, yeah, that, let's that's do the that. part that I, I really don't know. I'm a civilian. I'm not in the uh, yeah. public health service and I'm not uh, in the military. And I am certain there's a whole different set of rules uh, for how it works in government. But if you just think about your employer, for example, there may be an employee health clinic, which you can go to if you happen to injure yourself on the job. But yeah. you have your own doc for right. your personal health. And you don't necessarily share one thing with the other. Right. I have my doubts about whether or not Ronnie Jackson was ever uh, Barack Obama's one and only personal physician. He was clearly the White House doctor for a while. Um, I, and I guess the same question exists about Donald Trump, except that Donald Trump doesn't strike me as the kind of guy who's like, I really need a serious picture of my health and I want to talk to a doctor I trust. It just yeah. wants to get a, a good I, I, I'm not making a big deal of it. I'm just saying that there's not a lot of transparency here. Yeah. And it's, it's really a little opaque about what goes on. And therefore, what kind of standard are you supposed to hold this guy to? I it's really don't know. know. However, it would be up to the president. I just want to I, I, – just to help Donald Trump out a little bit. Um, he might be a drunk and he might be passing out you know, narcotics to a lot of people and he's going to do your colonoscopy. Right. So but the thing is, you should check this out. <laughs> well, he's got his own personal physician I, for that. You know, does he? I don't know. Hurt. I'm not certain that that's the case. I would think that he GI would guy? look into it. Remember him? The, the second replacement for Ronnie Jackson? Well, the guy. That's the problem. I have met his other doctor, uh, yeah. or in the press, and I, you know, pick, tell you, you what, pick him out of a hat. I don't care. Neither one of these guys is doing this. <laughs> I just, I mean, I'm, 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 maybe I'm hypersensitive to it. I'll be turning maybe, fifty maybe. this year, and I want to be sure that uh, my guy isn't bombed. So, the thing is, I don't know. I'm even taking Trump out of the picture. Trump is uh, who he is. He has no shame. He doesn't care about anything. He has the worst people working for him. Most of the people around him are either crooks or incompetents. Let's just uh, let's just suggest that that's a given. All right. I'm All just right. a lot yeah. more interested in what was Ronnie Jackson's career and performance during the Obama administration. Yes. And if he did, in fact, go on um, a trips to uh, foreign countries and got drunk there, how come he's still working there? I don't know. Uh, my guess is that he was kept at, was and still is, perhaps even by Trump, just kept it. Well, no, I can't say that about Trump because he nominated him to be VA secretary. Kept at arm's length. I think that this is sort of a cushy job, and uh, the presidents who are are loath to ruin the careers of high ranking military officials who are probably within a certain number of years of retirement, and they just say, you know, when I need a serious checkup or I want to check on something on my personal health, I have a guy. And once a year, I have to let this guy say what my blood pressure is. Mm. And I think they just leave it at that. Right. Just don't nominate him to anything serious. He's not an internist, by the way. He's an emergency room guy. Well, um, that that would make a certain amount of sense if, if the job chiefly is yeah, travel around with me I mean, and it, patch it, me up. For the job, decide. because you want to be able to have right. somebody who could respond to an emergency, that makes total sense. Yeah, but the drug in terms of not. getting my regular checkup, I wouldn't go to the emergency room to do that. That I is would, my regular doctor. <laughs> that's true. And how interesting is that? Because the the current president is one of those guys who says, Psh, "You don't need health insurance. Go to the emergency room." 
Mm-hmm. All right. Well, you so don't. At, at the highest level, apparently he does. You know, it could be that some Maybe of these allegations does, just aren't no true. Idea. Because they are allegations. Oh, I mean, there's a lot well, of different moving well, parts here. That? What if you want to shaft some guy? Maybe it's that rival who just gives you that information. Mm. Yeah, maybe that guy was drunk. I don't know. I, I mean, there's certainly a lot to, to a lot, lot of questions. questions so there's going to be more comes in. That's <laughs> what the report is coming. One of which is, yeah, why did you release that uh, that IG report? So no real no real answers there. No, but I just it, it, the whole situation raises a whole lot more questions than it answers, and so. therefore, certainly, you have the situation where, in a normal situation with a normal president, the guy wouldn't have been nominated in the first place. Right now that he's been nominated and embarrassed by all of these allegations, which may or may not be true and may or may not make sense, a normal person would have withdrawn the nomination. So Trump, of course, yes. does the opposite and doubles down on it. Right, right, and now it reverts back to the Senate to actually do their job of advice and consent and do the vetting that the White House never did. Mm -hmm. So they canceled his hearing because now they need more time because they actually have to put some work into this. Yeah, well, uh, that's uh, that the, they, they were hoping to avoid that work by having vetting done up front. Right. And then who they, cares? I think everybody in the Senate, if they haven't Shh. already, now has to understand there is no vetting. Yeah. And therefore, for every nominee, you have to do it. And that puts the Mike Pompeo, who turns out maybe didn't serve overseas in the military the way he said he did, and everybody else that Trump nominates, you have to assume none of it's true and you have to go do your own work. So you guys are on notice. That right? is true. Like, do that. Of course, I have a more basic problem. I like them to assume that every written communication that arrives that says I've nominated somebody is questionable too. I don't know you made that nomination. You may be drunk for all I know, and I want to see you do it. Come here and sign it. I don't accept, you know, auto pen stuff. I don't accept uh, right. communications from an office that they just chucked the guy out the other month who who was an amateur uh, forger of your signature. Forget All right, it. so you're gonna you're gonna go down on process and you're gonna make them like do everything. You can really slow everything down if you do that. You could, and I think they should. Yeah. So let's, uh, in a few minutes I have left, talk about some other lightning round things because there's a bunch of other names in the news too. There's Mick right. Mulvaney. Yes. Is he drunk? You know what he did lately? Uh, y yeah, sort of. But uh, let's let's get the details of it. I, I understand he was a, uh, a loudmouth jerk. Who told everybody that Congress is corrupt. Yeah. So yes. the New York Times says – Mick Mulvaney, the interim director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, mm -hmm. told banking industry executives and lobbyists on Tuesday yes. that they should increase their campaign donations to influence lawmakers, revealing that he would meet only with lobbyists who contributed to his campaign when he serves in the House. Yes, that's good advice. As he had a hierarchy Hank in my office and, in Congress, Mr. Yeah. Mulvaney, former Republican lawmaker from South Carolina, told 1,300 bankers and lobbyists at an American Bankers Association conference in Washington if you're a lobbyist who never gave us money, I don't talk to you. If you're a lobbyist <laughs> who gave us money, I might talk to you. Yes. So uh, uh, as Adam Smith on Twitter points out, we're really in the say the quiet part out loud era of politics. And that's really what Trump has given us. True. Uh, that's a common malady. And uh, that probably endeared him to Trump a little bit. And now he's, <clears throat> pardon me, he's not in Congress. And so... You can't uh, can't take you that can't to hold, the ethics. You can't hold for that, right? So, point. But you know, he's just explaining how things work. Yeah. Then well, we have right. uh, Mr. Don Blankenship running for uh, senator in West Virginia. Yes, on the murder ticket. Excellent. A, yeah. A recent uh, poll found a fluid race. This is Casey Hunt tweeting with Mr. Blankenship trailing his rivals, but about one in four voters undecided. Mm. On Monday, responding to the attack ads, Mr. Blankenship brought up Mr. McConnell's marriage to Elaine Chao the Secretary of Transportation, Yes. and questioned whether the majority leader faced a conflict of interest in foreign relations. Ms. Chow's father is, quote, a wealthy China person. <laughs> well, he, he wasn't sexist about it. That's the point. He was trying not to be sexist. China he just person. He racist instead. Right? <laughs> and, and there's well, a lot of connections to some of the brass, if uh, you will, in China. The brass. Okay. I don't think China person is a word. Every time I think China person, China people person. were tweeting these pictures of people in like, you know, China barn with, you know, surrounded by uh, plates and dishes and right. stuff like that. That's what Holes I think of China, China person. China person shops. Uh, yeah, China person. Don Blankenship is a terrible person. By well, the way. he's a murderer. 
well, yeah, he's a murderer, uh, but he's a he's a terrible person. I, I suppose there can be nice murderers out there. But there are one. fine people on both sides of every murder. It's true. Yeah, I suppose. I suppose. And uh, he could be one of them. Yeah, I, we have uh, yet to determine whether or not murdering coal miners is a net negative in West Virginia. So we're yeah, we're going to find out, mode. though. Yeah, one in four West Virginians are undecided on whether or not Murdering miners is a good idea. And, and as you know, that's what the coal miners wanted. Uh, he's got his finger on the pulse of the coal mining community, does Donald Trump. Right. And uh, his boy is, likes to kill him. And he, will be, he would be, if he were to win and make it to the Senate, would be the second national Republican during the Trump administration to be a mass murderer of coal miners in high office. So, Speaking of mass murderers, let's good. turn to Toronto for this last piece I have here. All right. That was this is an life. author, a, a journalist named Arshi Mann, A-R-S-H-Y, M-A-N-N, Arshi Mann. Oh. Uh, he writes Archie the Manny. Daily Extra on LGBT issues. Uh, he's in Toronto. He's uh, written for Maclean's and, and uh, CBC News, Toronto Star, you know, solid uh, – uh, journalistic credentials here Canadian. for the past little while he says i've been working on a piece about toronto's relationship to the alt-right especially the manosphere unfortunately mm. that research has become relevant i'm going to share as much as i can here for people who may <laughs> not be familiar with these movements unfortunately it's become relevant i guess it has because that I mean, guy who mowed everybody down yeah with the, uh, i just with the van was part of it didn't you hope it would become relevant though i mean mm. in a different way i guess that's the yeah. okay so now we have to introduce the term incel, I-N-C-E-L. Yeah, right. Because this has come up before. Incel refers to voluntary celibate. You may right. remember that from the Isla Vista, California shootings. Yeah, that's... Uh, uh, essentially meaning that a person can't uh, get laid because of their looks, personality. The incels <laughs> make up one segment of the broader manosphere, a collection of online masculinist communities that interplay with one another and yet that doesn't seem like it would be traditionally masculine at all in the uh, stupid gender role sense of well as Archie man points out incel was the term actually coined by a queer toronto woman in the 90s oh to give a name to how she was feeling at the time it morphed into something horrific i can't uninvent the word nor restrict it to the nicer people who need it she said Self-described incels today are almost entirely men who are laser-focused on their inability to have sex and blame women. Of the manosphere communities, incels are the most virulently misogynistic. They have a variety of memes and tropes that they return to constantly, such as Stacy, an attractive woman who has sex, and a Chad, an attractive man who has sex. So they are not Chads, and they always are running after Stacys, I suppose. I see. Non-incels are described as normies, and they're also derided. Doesn't this sound very familiar to the all-right yes. discussions we had it, it just prior to? It is the same to... discussion. That's the thing. Right. Yes. Quite so. Yeah. Elliot Roger, the Isla Vista shooter, is worshipped semi-ironically but also semi-seriously as a kind of god. His manifesto is shared and quoted, and he's constantly deployed as a meme. And then, of course, he gives examples. Right. Incels differ in important ways from men's rights activists, MRAs, while most movements – both movements are misogynistic. MRAs deploy a human rights framework to argue men are oppressed. Incels don't talk about rights. They just hate. So they're the extremists, the incels. Okay. The incel language is often explicitly racist. They can be especially focused on interracial relationship. That element of racial panic is prominent in Elliot Rogers' manifesto. Uh -huh. And there's a number of online destinations where incels gather. Guess where they are? Where? 4chan, Reddit. Oh, what do you know? At least Reddit was popular before it was shut down. R, in, R slash incels on Reddit. Uh, they moved yeah. to R brain cells, but it's not as widely used. Also, slut hate, the forum where Elliot Roger posted, formerly PUA hate. PUA. Um, PUA was one of those. Uh, I don't want to know. I, I, it, can you say it even? I, who, who, I, got, I get worried. As they're pickup artists. Oh, okay. I was like, oh, my God. Well, what could this be? You know. All right. Pickup artists. Got it. Uh, yes. Experts or, who give right. other people advice on how to pick girls up. Or get game, as they like to say. Well, incels often play out violent fantasies. People who report on the community have been trying to warn us that more incels will turn those fantasies into reality. Yeah. So they're talking about acid attacks and mass rapes, trying to hurt the people who won't sleep with them. The path to radicalization for incels often starts with the red pill slash pickup artist communities. They try to utilize the pseudoscientific dehumanizing seduction techniques. Mm -hmm. Still can't 
get laid, become infuriated, and that's how Elliot <laughs> Roger became who he was. Well, the uh, the self medication thing doesn't work, and so every everybody goes to hell. All right. All right. To clarify, and we'll just finish up here. I'm just telling you this because, like, this is one of those things, like three percenters, and other, you wouldn't know until somebody tells you. Right. To clarify, the manosphere is a catch-all term that refers to a number of online male communities that sure. overlap, branch off, interface, and oppose each other in complicated ways, including pickup artists, men's rights activists, incels, men going their own way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if this guy in uh, Toronto was one, and the author of the Facebook post. Uh, that uh, has been attributed to him as attack should probably be described as terrorism, although the lone wolf variety. Incels have an ideology, no. and the goal is to terrorize women and normies. Yes. Just so you know. That's why he's not a lone wolf. And uh, don't hesitate to call it terrorism because it hasn't been that long since we were all told that uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda suicide bombers were doing it on the promise of winning 72 virgins in paradise. It's the same problem. Same guys, same age, same methodology, and same delivery platform. Don't believe it's different. Hmm. Anyway, so uh, a lot here, a lot more. I'm not going to read the whole – that's not even the whole thing. But uh, again, uh, introducing a topic for information's sake so that your listeners have uh, some idea of what's going on. And that seems to be a lot of the motivating stuff that happened uh, in Toronto. Yeah, we didn't have as that well information yesterday. As well as I was in California, so it's happened here. Right. I mean, there's no reason to believe anything in particular like that would be isolated to Canada. It's an, it's a probably a bigger surprise that it happened there at all. Well, uh, you know, for but, anybody who just says, well, it's Canada, I don't have to read about it. Yeah, oh, actually, you should well, learn a little bit more. I do say that a lot, and it's wrong. Hmm. So with that, uh, you know, just uh, be happy. To, uh, you know, look at the uh, election results from yesterday. The blue wave is real. There's reasons why right. the uh, uh, generic ballot doesn't quite match. But uh, none of us is be- are being complacent about it. So hopefully nobody writes in about that. I'm beginning to despise that word. It doesn't mean that we're going to sit back and say, OK, it just happens. It only happens when you work at it. I see. Oops, and and there are a lot of our friends who are doing a lot of the hard work. Give them credit. And uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, Ohio 12, I guess, is next. Hmm. And with that, I'll sign off and leave the rest of the show to you and hopefully Joan. But uh, this is great work. And speaking to my good friend David Waldman Kager in the morning, introducing new terms yeah. uh, that sound like old terms. Right. Well, uh, and then we found out that they are old terms. They've just been perverted into new terms by weirdos on the alt-right. Uh, I was wondering aloud yesterday whether anybody thought that like, would a, it gets better campaign work for these guys? Like, you know, letting them know if you just stick with it one day, you'll find the right person for you. God help them. But, you know, you don't have to, like, call it quits at 22 right. and say, I'm never going to, you know, find anybody. Well, I mean, Donald Trump found three of them. Yeah. Well, so. you know, it cost them. I've so uh, with that, 16, uh, I'll, uh, I'll guess, leave you go, really. and uh, I'll catch up with you tomorrow. Okay. Maybe we'll know more about uh, what's happened with the Supreme Court arguments uh, that are going to go down about uh, the travel ban. Yeah. Well, uh, and it is a travel ban, and that's the big point of these discussions. So we'll we'll uh, round that up. We'll probably get a chance to reflect on that tomorrow on Friday. And yep. uh, Armando will say, uh, I saw it on TV. I got something to say about that. And, and he will so. because he's a practicing lawyer. Yeah, take care, and okay. uh, I'll talk to you. All right, very good. Thanks, Greg. We'll catch up Ooh. then tomorrow. Yeah, these uh, the incel guys. I mean, I, I feel like we've touched on it a little bit in the past because they all sort of swim around in the same primordial soup, these alt-right guys. And uh, I am very serious about that. I, I, I don't see any particular reason to differentiate between their type of terrorism and the the stuff that even uh you know blind trumpkins will view as terrorism uh that is to say they only they only acknowledge terrorism when muslims are involved and uh and very little else but uh, you know I, you you remember it the same way i do don't you that uh, there were years in there and i i mean it's been a long time since we've heard anything about it I don't know whether the theory was never valid and so therefore has long since been abandoned or whether it just fell out of fashion during the Obama administration to discuss such things. 
because they were, you know, uh, prejudicial in, in some way to, I don't know what, but, or maybe it was a concoction, a, a an invention of the Bush administration and the, uh, um, the likes of, uh, what's his name? The, uh, uh, the guy who's the national security advisor now with the giant mustache, John, why am I forgetting his last name? I want to say John Barron, but that's the fake guy from, <laughs> dang it. I don't know. I hate when I blank out on these things and it's, uh, there's no real reason for it and, uh, I can't explain it. But at any rate, I wondered whether between he and Dick Cheney that, uh, uh, Bolton, that's him, uh, whether that was something that they invented, thank you, uh, or or what. But I mean, I I, I could see it having some <clears throat> some basis in reality. I just I'm a little bit. I want to be cautious about uh, validating it as a real theory, because so much of what people were being told about what terrorism really was and what motivated radical, as they love to say, radical Islamic terrorism uh, was either a lie or just something they, uh, you know, concocted in, in their own minds and then made money lecturing to law enforcement officials about it as though they were real experts in the field. And uh, I guess there's some possibility that may have carried over. And, and I, I guess you got to be cautious about asserting that as fact. But it was certainly widely discussed that many radical Islamic terrorists, such as they were, <clears throat> were, were reportedly motivated by exactly the same issues, that they were young and alienated and disenfranchised and cut off from intimate relationships and had been indoctrinated sometimes over the internet to believe that it was everybody else's fault and that the lashing out, the terrorism itself, would be the redemptive thing. We'll take another break and come back to this and more. Welcome back now to the Kegger in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. I love the way the music jumps up when I finally cut back in. I appreciate that. We're going to have to automate this process. So what we really need to do is automate the process by which I automate these processes because uh, I'm still not doing it. When I get off the air and get the post-production taken care of, I need to put the show behind me for the rest of the day and uh, just uh, unwind that way. And it's difficult to jump back into the housekeeping parts of the show. But that's why uh, we're so grateful to Scott Anderson for taking a major chore off of my hands. It was really burning me out pretty quick. And uh, if I could remunerate it at the rate at which uh, it was re that it was really worth to me, that would be fantastic. Uh, but that's up to... Many of the rest of you as well. Well, thanks very much to those who have joined in. By the way, the Patreon campaign going very well and the numbers creeping up to a level where I, I was able at least to say, OK, I think I can uh, after, uh, you know, taking care of uh, uh, such expenses at the home front as I am able to take care of on a modest income, I was able to boost things a little bit for Scott, but I remind you in every uh, morning post that I am looking for your help in paying him uh, a, just a little bit closer to what his work is actually worth to us here. And uh, I do need your help in order to make sure that uh, he does get the opportunity to get paid a little bit more for the work he does in relieving the stress. Uh, I used to have to sort of be chained to the computer for uh, every day, all afternoon, pretty much until the kids got home, just to make sure that those summaries got done. And then I wondered for a while, maybe I should just give up on the summaries altogether. But no, I don't think that was the way to go. And Scott uh, got us out of that pinch nicely. Let's see, a couple of comments that have come in over the past few minutes of the show. Let's see, Matthew Rigdon wondering whether... Since Blankenship is a felon, can he even vote for himself? Good question. Don't know what the law is in West Virginia, though I suspect 
that being a felon doesn't necessarily cost you the franchise forever in West Virginia. It's a conservative state, and so they might normally go that way. But remember what kind of conservative state it is. It's uh, largely rural and poor, and uh, a lot of the rural and poor folks uh, will have, it tends to be the case, uh, felony records. And so I don't know how overwhelmingly popular such a law would be in West Virginia. Uh, and I would have thought that would have come up in the reporting. I haven't seen it. Um, but of course, the fact that you can't vote for yourself doesn't necessarily mean that you can't stand for office either. I mean, if you can murder coal miners in West Virginia and be a serious candidate for Senate, then I guess uh, anything could happen. And it probably doesn't matter whether you can vote or not either. Let's see. Karen D. Uh, let's see. Another question. How did the Navy recently approve Jackson's promotion to rear admiral, given the IG report? That is a good question also. And I think it just has to do with sort of the inertia of things at certain levels. Um, how important is it to you to know the records of who is being nominated for and receiving promotion to rear admiral in the Navy? In this particular case, for instance, I suppose it would be widely agreed. Uh, oh, he's drunk on the job a lot, maybe, allegedly. Let us say, no, maybe uh, we should get a different rear admiral. But in the, in the main, this is paperwork that gets pushed through. And I suspect that there are a lot of people at a lot of places along the way who basically say, eh, you know, he's been in the Navy for X number of years. Uh, if he's drunk on the job a lot, it probably means he doesn't love the job that much. Let's see how long till he can retire with a full pension. I bet that's about when we'll see him make for the exits. Let's just, you know, let's pad it a little bit. He's a good guy. He's a nice fellow. It's good to have lunch with. Maybe he plays golf. I don't know. So they, they push him forward and say, eh, what's the harm? He's not, uh, you know, we're making him a rear admiral. He's not going to see. Right? He's not taking a battleship group or a carrier group into combat. Eh, give him the extra pension money and let's be done with it. Now, then you make him physician to the president. And uh, that's why, again, I suspect that maybe the presidents were just sort of taking care of their real health concerns with their own physicians and just saying, again, the guy occupies a ceremonial office. He's a pleasant enough fellow who he's the guy that carries the Tylenol or in this case, the Ambien when we're flying overseas. And I also, I wouldn't be terribly surprised to find out that the past X number of administrations, that everybody was like, you know what, can you give me something to put me to sleep on the plane? Because who can sleep on a plane? I imagine, I, I can't sleep on a commercial flight. I am at, and it's not necessarily because the seating is so uncomfortable. That doesn't help. But I don't know. I get overly curious about things. I want to look out the window. I want to explore the stuff they have for me to do there. I want to make sure I don't miss out on getting a drink when the drink comes around uh, or the food, even though the food is terrible. Give me more of it or whatever. And I, I, What's on the movies? What's in the music channels? I can't fall asleep out of curiosity, childlike curiosity about what's going on on the plane. If I'm on Air Force One, forget it. I want to play with every toy. I need some of those M&Ms. Look at this seat. I want to try this seat. I want to move into this room. I'm going to sit at this desk. I'm going to sit at the table. Uh, for the president himself, I lie down and watch Telly Telly in the president's cabin there. I'd never fall asleep. But you got to be on your game when you arrive wherever you're going because fate of the world depends on it. You know what? I will take one of those Ambien after all. Wouldn't surprise me terribly. Would surprise me if I said, you know what, I'll take one of those Ambien after all. And the doctor said, sure, fine, here's one for you right now. I don't think he was that drunk. I don't know if he was drunk, drunk. I don't know if he was really drinking on the job, as people say. But you might want to find out. How does the Navy approve it? Because we all go along to get along. It's just exactly the garbage you would think, essentially. All right, what else have we got here? Um... Uh, Bill was saying it's now plausible that Jackson was drunk when he gave Trump his physical. It would certainly answer for his wildly inaccurate numbers. 
This is the world we live in, and that's not a joke. That's just straight up true. It's entirely possible. It might have been drunk when he was giving that press conference, for all we know. Oh, look at this. Here's uh, something new, just for uh, just for kicks. Let's add this one in here. Who's this? Jesse Larich, communications director pre uh, previously at OFA, uh, and uh, foreign policy spokesman for Hillary Clinton. Uh, let's see what he's got here. New, a FOIA request confirms this by the releasing of this photo. Confirms Steve Mnuchin took a $27,000 taxpayer-funded trip to Fort Knox to view the eclipse and then brazenly lied about it. He's pointing to the Think Progress entry from Danielle McLean, who writes that uh, this photo that accompanies the piece is the smoking gun of celestial event enjoyment, if there is a smoking gun for those things. You remember, of course, that he took that trip, uh, a very expensive one, on a military jet to Fort Knox last August, and then he said, oh, that wasn't because Fort Knox was going to be in the path of the eclipse that I went there for the afternoon with my wife. Uh, the photo, though, of course, is one of he and his wife actually viewing the eclipse. And you can tell because, uh, he one, he's not the dotard president of the United States. He is looking through eclipse glasses. And two, what the hell else would he be looking at uh, in that fashion anyway, even if he didn't have the glasses on? He's obviously looking at the sun, and there you have it. He's a, a big liar. But I think you knew that, but I thought you might find it was fun to have that little bit of proof. Uh, another sort of lightning round issue that's circulating, have you seen the now viral video of the very stupid Port Authority uh, uh, Commissioner, Karen Turner, that's spelled with a C, Karen Turner and a Democrat at that, I believe, uh, up in New Jersey. Uh, and it turns out she's actually also the on the ethics committee there. Port Authority ethics chairwoman is how she's described in this Politico tweet. Karen Turner resigned after being caught on video berating and threatening officers. I think her kids or one of her kids was a, her daughter in a car that got pulled over and they called mom and she came to berate the officer. She uh, she was interested in knowing why they were pulled over. I watched a little bit of this video yesterday. Interested in knowing what was the initial reason for pulling them over. Oddly, the officers do not want to say what it was. And that is a little bit suspicious. But then you can just note that and you really don't have to berate the officers. And by the way, there's also toward the end a little bit of profanity. She tells them uh, you can you can shut the F up, which was just sort of a little bit of side vignette of white privilege in all of this, too. Most people, let's say people of color who just tell officers who've pulled them over to shut the F up, don't get away with it as quickly and easily as she does. And of course, the irony here. Uh, as others are pointing out, the uh, as uh, Port Authority Commissioner, and apparently she also oversees, uh, I guess, as a commissioner, but I don't know if she serves on a certain committee as well. She was invoking to them the fact that she oversees the uh, the careers of and the uh, administration of some 4,000, she says, Port Authority police officers. These aren't Port Authority police officers. But she was making a big deal of it, and then so she would likely have known that she was being taped on dash cam, but she lost her head, and good. Now she's lost her job, too. She's resigned, and uh, so she should have. Let's see. Other uh, issues, uh, stories to pick up with? Hmm, let's see. Uh oh Rebecca Roman says there's a giant tantrum for the tod from the toddler in chief due any minute. Breaking Justice Department says Sessions will recuse himself from the investigation into Michael Cohen. This came after Bloomberg News reported that Sessions had declined to do so yesterday. That's true. And uh, I was wondering why he wouldn't resign or recuse himself uh, logically. But then I remembered, well, one, logic doesn't apply. And two, probably Donald Trump would be infuriated and fire him if he recused himself from anything again. Recalling, of course, Trump has been very outspoken and public about the fact that he would never have nominated Sessions to the job if he knew that he was going to recuse himself in this situation, which is an awfully stupid thing to say because, quite honestly, anybody who knows anything about uh, lawyers and the way they're supposed to handle such things, there would have been no doubt that uh, he was going to recuse himself. That would have been a given in any other 
administration. It's just that he was looking for Sessions to cheat on his behalf here, and he didn't do it. But I guess now, caught up in the inexorable logic of it, or tired of life in general, Sessions has said he will recuse himself. And so, uh, well, that's that's awfully interesting. I'll put that tweet aside for inclusion in today's roundup. And uh, another quick look at other things that are happening that uh, deserve our attention. Let's see. Hmm. What has... Uh, our Montreal girl, B.J. Hutch, to say this morning. How this culture is pervasive is being discussed. Oh, we're just noting that to others that we are discussing the pervasiveness of the uh, incel community and the uh, the online misogynists who are behind, I guess, the, uh, I don't know what, the, the, the wacko gang from which these two, these, the uh, both the Santa Barbara shooter and the Toronto attacker spring from. Okay, well, let's see. Uh, all right, so keeping a lookout for the giant tantrum slash final firing of Jeff Sessions. Uh, now on our radar, we can also see if we can round up a few other things. I did see an Armando tweet the other day, uh, other uh, minutes, I guess. Uh, I am confused about what's going on here. Uh, in this fight. I, I was wor- wondering about this. I can't figure out exactly what to make of the fact that there are New York Times people fighting somehow to defend Amy Chozik's, what, she got a book out, isn't it? Uh, and her article discussing these things as well about uh, defending the errors, apparently, that were made in her writing, uh, Chelsea Clinton, for instance, uh, just dropping into the conversation the other day to say, you know, there were a lot of, at least in this one case, one example that she gives, small bore inaccuracies in the article that she says, Chelsea says, could have been fact-checked quite easily, like, for instance, this claim in the book, for whatever reason, that Chelsea Clinton had had a keratin treatment on her hair, which I can't imagine why anybody would include that at all, but they did. And um, she just said, you know, if you had, I guess, if you had done some fact checking, by which I guess she means calling Chelsea Clinton and asking, did you get a keratin treatment? Uh, No, I didn't. Okay, well, then you would have found that out. And Brian Boitler making a very good point that, you know, these sort of small bore and some larger inaccuracies uh, lobbed at Michael Wolff over his book rendered him in the minds of serious journalists not worth taking seriously on any issue, and why wasn't the same to be applied to those who were New York Times reporters who wrote books, and that's a good question. And there was actually defense being mounted by Maggie Haberman and others, and I don't, uh, quite honestly, dying on Carrotton Hill didn't seem like a a particularly good idea, and I have seen some horrific feuds erupting in Twitter comments about these things. I guess the only thing I would say in that that comes in, I don't know, I guess you could put it in the favorable column for Chozik and others, is... Uh, I don't even know that the claim that uh, there was a keratin treatment in the offing is something that I would bother fact-checking because so what? And uh, why would anybody lie about it, including Chelsea Clinton? But if she says she didn't get a keratin treatment, then fine, she didn't. But uh, yeah, of course, it's morphed into something much larger and the New York Times folks are uh, in defensive crouches about everything. And if you find that they've done something wrong... They have to give you 200 words on why uh, either they're never wrong or you're just a a jackass uh, screaming about things from the bleachers who should shut up. Now, Armando, you're here. Let me see. Uh, But uh, Joan's answering, and I think that's going to put you on hold. But I'm not sure. (laughs) Joan, you're here. Hi. Hi. Okay. And Armando is not. Okay. Okay. So let's see. He wanted to talk about the Chozik. Call back because but... I want to hear that. Yeah, let's see uh, if we do that. Okay, so uh, hopefully he's he's out there. Uh, I'll have to give him that message somehow. We'll uh, let him know that. You want to hear about that too? Yeah. 
All right. Let me, uh, or I should say, let me call you. It's a slow news morning, oddly. I I don't get it, but yeah. Yeah. All right. I I don't either, but I'm not, I'm not certain (laughs) that I want to know in many ways. All right. Let's see if I can call him. Let's see. Do I want to hit this button or this button? This is the big guessing game here. Uh, Let's see. No, not that one. Let's try this one. Maybe this one will do. Here we go. Uh, let's see if I can add Armando to the call. Then we can all talk about Amy Chozik or or Maggie Haberman or both or Brian Boitler or keratin treatments or I don't know what. Yeah, Armando, are you here? I get this idea now, David. Right. You've got an actual real reporter now to talk about real actual important things in Joan. So. And, and now, go ahead. <laughs> I think she wants to hear <laughs> about this. For news, so... All right, let's make it quick. Okay. Good. And get to things that actually matter. Because the New York Times' relationship with Hillary Clinton is a pointless thing at this point. She's not running for anything. Who cares? Uh, just ah, okay, us yes. old heads who have been fighting about this for 20 years. Uh, Amy Chozik wrote her book. Yes, and it sounded like everyone was happy about excerpts, it. And I said I was open to buying it because it sounded like she was having some reckoning with what happened. Mm-hmm. Right. There are some things in there that are apparently inaccurate. Okay. That's a problem. That's a problem for any book. It's a problem for any article. You need to be accurate. Don't put things in unless they're accurate. She said she hired a fact checker. Apparently a fact checker didn't do a good job on what appears to be some mundane things. One, not so mundane, which is yeah, this the idea that Chelsea was popping the cork of champagne on the election night. Okay. Maybe, that's a bad thing to put in there if it's not true. Uh, true. That's true, and I would maybe say that's something to fact check. I, I, the, the keratin thing I would excuse on the basis uh, of, all right, maybe she did. Or maybe she didn't. Uh, I, don't know. I, I would excuse as, I don't even right. care, but it's, it is an inaccuracy, and you want to be accurate. Yeah, I'd rather me, be accurate. Particularly when you're writing about other people. Yes, but, but it doesn't hurt it, terribly uh, if you're inaccurate on that one. But the, it morphed into... This morning, well, and even yesterday, Lemieux's like, oh, you know, Hillary is bad with the press. The press is bad with her, and Bill Clinton wasn't bad with the press, and he got bad coverage, so I didn't buy that argument. But then Jeet and his uh, inimitable Jeet style uh-huh. comes up with some, you know, the intergenerational feud oh, oh. angle to, to inaccuracies, and we're all freaking out on him there. Again, this is all meaningless gibberish perfect for twitter frankly mm. uh but uh you know i mean the new york times is vendetta against the clintons it to me is there is undeniable from whitewater till october 31st when they ran an fbi fbi sees no clear link between trump and russia yeah. and that the russians weren't trying to help trump they were just trying to disrupt story which was completely false in every particular and has never been addressed by the New York Times to this day. And Dean or James Heck Comey. says it was mm. accurate. So it's insane that anybody would deny that the New York Times has a personal institutional vendetta against all Clintons. That's just what they have. Well, by the way, what, you think they're not human and they don't have personal animuses? Institutions are people. The idea that you have to deny the obvious because, oh, well, the institution. What, are you kidding me? It's obvious. It it happened. It is. Frankly, it's no longer. It's water under the bridge. I mean, I think if you're as smart as a Democrat, you use it to, frankly, work the refs on The New York Times with regard to other Democrats. That's the smart thing to do. But, I mean, if we're being trying to analyze it historically and objectively. And accurately, it is ridiculous that any not the New York Times will defend itself with its nonsense. Nick Confessori had quite a couple of days the other day on on coverage of the hacked emails where he mm-hmm. just was. I mean, I think he destroyed himself with his own arguments. But be that as it may, that's you know, that's actually a, a journalism issue going forward. I mean, if state actors are going to steal information for political purposes to use in elections i think you know 
responsible media outlets really going to have to grapple with that fact uh, and understand that it means you don't publish stories about risotto and silly <laughs> campaign infighting because somebody who sent a mean email about Bernie Sanders. I mean, you've got to have a little more news judgment than that now. You've got to be responsible, particularly was, if you – go ahead. Sorry. Was what Jeet was was – tweeting about this Vanity Fair story about the Civil War at the New York Times? No. Uh, uh, tweet Because it's kind of a generational thing. The war he was when is the Chosick Chelsea Clinton one right now and he said okay. he, was, he took some weird intergenerational few uh, thing. When the story he, is he may have you been know, talking about it yeah. Fix them. Yeah. I, I just forwarded the Vanity Fair it, link yes. or put that in, in chat in Skype. Um yeah, it's kind of it's telling what's going on at the New York Times in one I haven't read the whole article. Laura says it's not all that great, but this part is sort of telling with Dean how do you Backwit? Backet. Backet. He pronounces it Backet. Yes. Who was absolutely exhilarated, they say, on election night <laughs> uh... because We've got a great story on our hands now. Oh, well. You know, he was thrilled that Trump won because it was going to be so good for the paper and for the story. Yeah, it's a bad thing to say because all of a sudden it's something that a journalist should never say, even if they think it. I understand the impulse. Yeah. Oh, and he told colleagues he was really surprised that the younger people on staff were sad were upset and discouraged and worried because hmm. you know he, he's got he, this uh, that's interesting now. <laughs> it, it did Beckett is possibly the worst editor of a newspaper in my lifetime worse than Hal Raines which is a I... remarkable thing to be <laughs> if you ever see me on Twitter at least once a day I think I say cancel your subscription to the New York Times because the New York Times is a bad newspaper on politics they may be all right on sports or science coverage and arts and leisure. If you like to read the story about the Broadway show, fine. But the main purpose of a newspaper is to cover politics, at least in the larger sphere. And the New York Times is terrible at it. And what makes it especially problematic is it is the paper of record. Still, if we could just make it any old newspaper, I would not care. I would care, but not like I do now. The problem is it's the New York Times. And what really exacerbated everything about the New York Times in the last two or three years was it hired the entire staff of Politico to write about politics. Yeah. It was already bad before with the morning doubtization, but then it just accelerated to politicization that is – just extremely damaging to the body public. The, the, the New York Times is a cancer on our politics right now, as much as Trump is, in my view. Uh, and, and Trump is the president, and he can hurt us much worse than the New York Times, but the New York Times props him up. Maggie Haberman's just incompetent as a reporter on Donald Trump. She doesn't know how to cover a Donald Trump. Uh, the New York Times few, doesn't few know do. how to cover Donald Trump. Dean uh, Beckett doesn't know how to cover anything, but yeah. he's especially bad at covering a Donald Trump. I, I, and it's a serious problem in our media now that the New York Times is this bad right now because Donald Trump is president. That's something I talk about all the time because I think it's that's actually important. Uh, Amy Chodzik's book and her carotene there, that's just the <laughs> okay. symptom of the problem. Uh but the larger problem is Maggie Haberman thinks she knows what Donald Trump is doing. She doesn't know anything about Donald Trump in terms of the damage he is, the, the damaged person he is, and the damage he will do to our country and has done to our country. If she so does, she seems it, They're inadequate seems for the moment. They yeah. have failed. They failed in 2016, 2015, and they failed in 2017, 2018. Do they break stories because someone hands it to them? Sure. That's nice. David and I have this discussion a lot. I force it on him. David Fahrenheit <laughs> digs things out. The New York Times has stories handed to them. Those are two different brands of reporting. We need more David Fahrenheit reporting and much, 
less, if any, New York Times reporting. Because you know what? When people want to hand you a story, they'll find somebody to hand it to. We don't need the New York Times for that. They'll hand it to the Washington Post oh, that's true. or the Los Angeles Times or NBC. We don't need the, what the New York Times is. Anybody can be the paper of record. Uh, well, I, right. I don't know if you can That's build yourself into That's my to let you guys talk real issues because <laughs> this is all nonsense. Uh, well, it's a, it is a serious issue underlying all the rest of them. But, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll pick this up on the other side of a two-minute break and uh, finish things out. We'll search for news where we can find it with Joan, or maybe we'll just sit well, here and Ronnie say there Jackson is none. It sounds like the story of the day. Oh, Dave, Lord. It's amazing. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the K-Grow in the Morning Show, which has still sort of been going on during the break. We've had a good time discussing everything, but uh, how, how can you not have a good time when there are so many stories? We say there's a lack of news, but uh, I don't know. It's, it's As we said in the first part of the show, it's still news when the White House doctor is alleged to be drunk on the job and uh, who knows what. I guess harassing employees by banging on their hotel room doors unless you know there's a there's a hundred mosquitoes on your door and I'm killing them all. That's all. I don't know what his yeah, excuse is. And the other, be. I guess, serious, and I don't know if Greg talked about it and after this, I'll sign off, is this idea of just handing out pills. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. What was, the hell is that? I don't know. I would yeah. do that too. <laughs> I'm going down in flames. If I'm the <laughs> the doctor, I'm a White House doctor, sure. Absolutely. I'm going to well, get everybody explain has pills. his press conference a little bit yeah. better. Oh, boy. 6'3". 239 pounds press Great conference. Teams. I mean, if he's drinking on the job. Right. He was describing uh, the... It, it uh, actually, you've made a joke, but I think it does explain it in a different way. He's been a butt kisser his whole yeah. life. Mm. Yeah. And this was just more butt kissing. Well, and in fact, the IG report from 2012, and, and this is back to the idea that, yeah, the Obama administration might have some things to answer for. Mm -hmm. yep. Apparently, what all of that was about was he was fighting with the other White House doctor over who got to take credit for being the first family's physician. Oh my God. Why? And, and that was when they recommended that he be replaced. Both, or, uh, either yeah. or both. But he, which he, the Obama yeah. administration did not do. I think, you know, whether it was the no drama Obama thing. Mm -hmm. No, it wasn't. I or, remember that when we're in a re-election campaign and I just don't want to deal with this or. I, I don't think so, D Joan. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but remember when Ronnie Jackson did that press conference? Yeah. The vigorous defenders of Ronnie Jackson were all the Obamaites. Yeah. Axelrod and all these people. He schmoozed these people. They loved oh. him. Yeah. They loved him. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe he maybe supplied them. Maybe he gave them pills. Yeah, he's a exactly. friendly drunk. Maybe. I understand. You know, if well, he's a belligerent well, drunk. Friendly. Maybe they, he wasn't drunk. drunk with them. But uh, oh. anyway, here's what I'm going to do because you guys have important things to talk about instead of my gibberish. I'm going to hang up and listen. First time caller, long time <laughs> listener, I'll just hang up and call and listen. <laughs> First time. That's good. There is important news, however, in the Jackson thing. Uh, yes. There is very much. There is right, the I'm listening total. Now. <laughs> Bye. Go, go. And, and with Pruitt, with everything else that we've seen, there is – everybody yes. talked about the vetting process broke down yeah. with this. There is no vetting process. That's – that's the – you only have to break down once if the breakdown is let's get rid of the vetting process. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's this nuts. guy's in the room. Trump thinks he's fun. Trump likes him. He gets pills from him, whatever. 
mm-hmm. oh, okay, you can do this job. Yeah. That's uh, the vetting process. Yes. I don't know whether he got, I mean, nobody knows whether he, Trump got pills from him, but there's lots of, I mean, the, 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 there's all kinds of rumors about Trump and pills, certainly, that's out there. Uh, not all of them in his lifetime would have come from Ronnie Jackson. None of them, probably, uh, or up to this point, anyway. He has other guys that give him the pills, but maybe that was part of it. But I, I think he, he's clearly a schmoozer. I mean, everybody who deals with him likes him. It's just Trump's the only person who's been president. But here's the thing. He's just the latest in a long string of disastrous nominees. Yes, and this time, Republicans are uncomfortable with it, probably because it is the VA and they do take yes. that semi-seriously. Right. But we have had a whole string of them rubber stamped. Yeah. I mean, we've got Wendy Vitter coming up that they are seriously considering. Yeah. You know, Grassley is saying, OK, we can put this one through, even though she questions whether Brown versus Board of Education was rightly decided. Yeah. Yes, or at least declines to say what she thinks. Uh, well, and when you're but, declining yeah, to say on right, that one, right? I think we got a clue where you're coming from. <laughs> yeah, that's basically it. It's like, uh, how do you feel about democracy? Well, I don't know. I don't. Uh, I, I, de- I let's defer on that. One. Well, you're really supposed to say uh, it's fantastic. It's the best form of governance possible how do you do you like america ah uh, i don't know uh, it, no easy answer brown v board of education well gee whiz i don't know segregation was okay oh see bad can't do that but yes i mean they were seriously considered think of all the people that they've seriously considered think of all the people they've already approved they could, yes horrible. the people that have been confirmed thank yeah. you very much yesterday one horrible anti-lgbt anti-abortion mm-hmm. argued to disallow contraceptives on health insurance policies he's 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 now a judge yeah thanks joe manchin way to go uh but you know it's a confusing place west virginia they might elect a coal miner murderer so they might it's hard to tell where they are yeah uh, well, yeah, but uh, and and I think he did. I read correctly. They were talking. He's on the Fifth Circuit now, not just a federal yeah, judge, yeah. right? So. so the Fifth is even worse than it was, <laughs> which is yeah. kind of hard to imagine. But <laughs> yep, yep. So so much for that. But uh, yeah, I mean, oh, back to Scott Pruitt was you know, another round of you know he's even more corrupt than you yeah. may first have believed. Stories Tom Price. Uh, right, and he's gone. But, yeah, and now this morning, Mick Mulvaney. Right, and just a few minutes ago, who is telling banks now yeah. bribe me? Right, or at least bribe Congress banks people. to bribe him. That's uh, it's good. He's hanging out of shingles. Entrepreneurial, and we like that in this country. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the quick news on Scott Pruitt this morning was that uh, the head of his 200,000 strong personal army or whatever it is, 20 person security detail, that's it, uh, <laughs> is uh, uh, moonlighting as well outside of work. He is a former Secret Service agent, now heads his security detail. He was the replacement for the previous guy who headed security and said, uh, no, you can't, uh, you know, blow through red lights on your way to dinner. Uh, oh, I can't. Well, you're fired. And said oh, he yeah, brought in this other guy. Fired. Yeah. So the the new guy is uh, apparently moonlighting while heading up security for Pruitt is also taking payment from American Media Incorporated, AMI, the uh, National Enquirer people, who are the ones you know behind the uh, capture and kill of the uh, sex scandal stories for Donald Trump. Same people are also paying the head of Pruitt's security detail as a private investigator. In other words, one of the guys that uh, the National Enquirer pays to dig up dirt about, well, whoever they're after or whoever might be a political enemy of their patrons in politics. Uh, And uh, when we're not paying you for that, you can stay on the public dole 
and ferry the incredibly corrupt Scott Pruitt around town, maybe with the lights on. So uh, just a weird crossover of one corruption story with another, the tendrils of the corruption stories entangling, and that's why everybody's worried about collusion, because there's a lot of back scratching going on between people who should not have anything to do with one another, but are all somehow spokes on the, out of the hub of Trump. Okay, I'm very curious about this. Is it is he doing opposition research on his enemies? Is he trying to squelch anything that might be out there about him that's even worse than what we already know? Well, uh, this, I, I, I would yeah. I would think probably the former because he is truly deeply scarily paranoid. Uh yeah. He definitely is, and uh, yeah, well, I'm not sure exactly what's going on here, but uh, the New York Times has the in-depth piece on it, and I think we can maybe get a flavor of it more quickly by looking at TPM here. Pruitt, security chief, worked as private investigator for owner of pro-Trump tabloid. Uh, so those are the basics. The guy's name is Pasquale Nino Perota, which uh, I think in the last time we called the name out, we said, you know, that sure raises no red flags in FBI offices anywhere. But uh, he apparently performed regular work for National Enquirer publisher American Media Incorporated during the 2016 election, according to a person with knowledge of the company's internal workings. But unlike another private investigator hired by the Enquirer, Perota didn't work on such newsroom projects as tracking down sources. Instead, the person told the Associated Press on Tuesday, Perota was engaged to discreetly handle investigative work at the direction of AMI chairman and CEO David Pecker. Not sure what that's supposed to mean, but it doesn't sound good. The person, uh, uh, of course, speaking on condition of anonymity. But uh, in addition to his job at EPA, Parada is the top executive at Sequoia Security Group, a Maryland-based security firm. Lots of Sequoias in Maryland. None, of course, but well, okay, it sounded nice. The person with knowledge of the situation didn't know whether Parada was paid for his work for AMI and Pecker through Sequoia or another business entity, uh, mentioning that he's a former Secret Service agent. He's worked for EPA for more than a decade and tapped to head up Pruitt's security team after the other guy got uh, tossed out for whistleblowing. So it's not entirely clear what he was doing for AMI, uh, but he also was the guy who spearheaded the purchase of the $43,000 soundproof booth for Pruitt's <laughs> office, which uh, has since been found to be uh, to have been illegally contracted for. Uh, and uh, Democratic lawmakers on Tuesday uh, sent a strongly worded letter Questioning yes. whether Parada was improperly operating an outside consulting firm without proper approval from EPA ethics officials. <laughs> what would be the point of asking those guys anything? <laughs> They're handing out uh, dispensations like Ambien on Air Force One, apparently. Uh, so, well, let's see. Uh, anything else that tells us anything about it? During the 2016 campaign, of course, which is when he was working for Pecker and AMI, uh, the National Enquirer was in close contact with Trump's personal attorney, Michael Cohen, while it attacked Trump's Republican opponents from its perch in supermarket checkout aisles, printing thin allegations about Senator Ted Cruz's personal life and alleging Democratic candidate Hillary Clinton was in declining physical and mental health. Uh, AMI also helped Trump in far less public fashion with a $150,000 payment to the former Playboy Playmate who was uh, allegedly having an affair with Trump. And, uh, well, there's more to it, but I wonder if maybe his job at the time was helping dig up dirt or keep people quiet since the work was performed during the campaign. And maybe Ted Cruz would like to know whether the current head of Pruitt's security apparatus was part of the game of printing allegations or feeding Trump allegations that his father uh, assassinated JFK or whatever the hell else <laughs> that was going on. Because, uh, you know, he's got a vote in all this and um, ha presumably would have a say in whether Pruitt is eventually forced out. If all, you know, if Republicans in the Senate were 
likewise willing to say, well, you're just that much of a scumbag that we'll just vote to get rid of you, impeach you, toss you from out of office, then you just better leave on your own terms instead. But uh, as we know, there's no insult that can be delivered to Ted Cruz that's going to move him to action against Donald Trump. And we knew that in 2016. Uh, it's more clear now. So, uh, right. So there's no news as far as I know beyond that. <laughs> and the, the drunk pill dispensing doctor at the White House. Uh, Who apparently still has the full support of the White House. Sure. I mean, from yesterday's press conference, you would think, yeah, not so much when Trump is basically right. up there saying, no, leave, really, yeah. really. There's no reason for you to deal with all of this. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. You don't need this. You know what? But that well, that was Howard Stern's advice to you, and you didn't listen. So why would he listen? Right. I can't. I can't imagine why that would. Uh, although I am surprised that when Jackson heard about the nomination, that he didn't say, "Oh, you know, Mr. President, thank you so much. It's an honor, but really, thank you, but no, thank you." I just. Well, apparently he tried to. Yeah, because that makes more sense That's than not yeah. hard enough. Clearly, yeah, right. <laughs> um, wow, I, it's hard to see how this turns out. I, they keep pushing. Um, I don't think we are going to see Isaacson actually have hearings. This is mm. this is one of those truly bipartisan committees. The where moment. they actually do, you know, work yeah. together and okay. talk to each other. And John Tester, the ranking member, has been the one up front on this, mostly talking to the press. Um, he talked to NPR last night about some of the allegations. This morning on CNN, he says they have four sources. Four okay. people independently came to the Senate veterans affairs committee and said he was drunk on a foreign trip banging on the door of the female so loudly that the secret service became concerned he might wake up the president the dispensing mm. pills everything i mean we've got tester speaking for the committee saying yeah. we've got all of this and it's credible I, I don't see isaacson even going forward with a hearing on it i, I think yeah. it's going to be postponed indefinitely so well, we might be at an impasse here thankfully it's one of those jobs where you actually need senate approval because john bolton did all the same things it's just he was up right. for a job that he didn't need approval for right so fantastic you know if you're worried about banging on people's doors in hotel rooms john bolton's your guy he practically invented it but that was a virtue for him plus also we don't care what the senate has to say about this it's only the national security advisor here we go. Right. So, and by the way, yes, just the whole corruption thing. Ah. Mick Mulvaney is acting as a as right, CFPB right. director without anybody's approval. Yes, that's just, that's true too. That nobody bothered to confirm him. He's just sort. Is he's just acting? He's squatting. Something or other or, yeah, he's squatting, and it is in front. Whatever of happened to the. The mm -hmm. D.C. Court of Appeals right now. Yes. OK. Thank the, you. the dispute over the directorship. But so far, they're not stepping in to say, um, no, hmm. he can't do these two jobs. He can't do this one on your whim. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that happens soon. Yeah. So he's out there telling <laughs> banks how to get around what his agency does. Yeah. Well, that's. That's one of the, uh, well, or, I don't. <laughs> I guess it's the prerogative of the uh, of the administrator there to say, well, I uh, I'll, I'll tell you how to defeat me. I mean, eventually that's what happens anyway. Ordinarily, we wait until they go through the revolving door and then do it for hire later on. He's just getting a jump start on things and doing it for less money. That's very virtuous of him, getting ahead of the game and taking less money. Of course, he's taking our money for doing it rather than theirs, but uh, he'll eventually get around to get, taking that too, I guess. In the meantime, Meanwhile, he says, give it to my friends. Job, yes. His, his OMB job, he's still working with Kevin McCarthy on trying to come up with a rescissions package huh. for the spending bill from March yeah. that Trump hated so much. So that's happening still too. They're still 
Okay, and uh, no... even though the Senate has said no, yeah, we're not doing that. Well, the and Senate lots saying... in the House have said no, we're not doing that because, of course, we've got to have another spending bill done by September thirtieth. Hmm. Yeah, so that's uh, that's hard and enough. And it's going to be kind of hard to get everybody on board the next spending bill if you're still fighting over the last spending bill. Yes. That's right. You but were writing about that the other really day. Really close to an election, so yeah, there's not going to be. Any, there would never. There wouldn't be any time to to deal with that normally. Um, uh, but I I saw that you were writing about this the other day, and in the headline that you had here, Republicans fear another meltdown as Trump pushes spending bill claw back. That would be the rescissions. Budget committees give up, and I I didn't get to the story yet, and uh, I I have another story. Elsewhere in pocket about the budget committees giving up. Are you saying you're not saying that they're giving up on their opposition to rescissions? You're just it, it's something else that they're they're giving not up on. doing anything. Okay. They Give, are I'm not giving up on working, producing at all. a budget. Ah, okay, yeah, that's the difference. Uh, okay, yeah, because I, I I know we discussed that a little bit, and I have another story here somewhere that that basically the budget committees are saying. Uh, well, I mean. In the Senate side, didn't didn't we hear that they just basically said, "Yeah, we're unnecessary as a committee. We should just close down entirely." Pretty much, even though there's the is, was it not the Budget Control Act? There is an act of Congress that says the Budget Committee must meet yes. and must produce a budget. Yes, by April fifteenth, but never mind. It's now April twenty fifth. Right, right. <laughs> they're they're not meeting. They're not doing it. Yeah. That's one of the – it's a recurring problem with regulating the way government business is done. They – they the, a lot of these statutes or rules uh, were written at a time when it was enough to say, well, the books say you need to do this and you would be publicly embarrassed if you didn't. And that no longer holds with people. The, the fact that there's no penalty written into the – the laws or in some cases into the rules going back a few years. I'm thinking of a totally different situation. But if you don't have penalties written into it, the Republicans very quickly anyway got wise to that and said it doesn't have a jail sentence or a fine or anything attached to this. So what if I just don't? And yeah, now we're, we're this is how we've gotten stuck in strongly worded letter mode. But, but for if, the last it, decade. if we pass a balanced budget amendment, that, that one will do. We'll take yes. that one seriously. Well, maybe I don't yeah. know. Does it to say anywhere in there what the pe- what the penalty is if you don't <laughs> balance no. it? Yeah, see, I think we may have made the same mistake again. But that's fine because we're never going to balance the budget, and uh, we might as well not hand ourselves penalties we don't intend to uh, enforce. But yeah, there's nothing in there that says all it says is you have to produce a budget by April fifteenth. But if you don't. It still becomes yeah. April 16th and you still get paid. So that's if, what they do. Leadership is basically telling them not to do it because now that they've passed the last spending bill, they've created these spending levels. That means they're going to be passing a budget that says we're spending a trillion dollars again. And they don't want to do that so close to the election. Ah. So – what that tells me is that we're setting up another, essentially a continuing resolution for into 2019. Yes. Or, you know, mm-hmm. the week before Christmas of 2018. Possibly. Yeah, I don't know when the next thing runs out. But uh, well, I don't even remember to. where we... They, they, September 30th. Uh, oh, okay, so they finished it all the way to the end of the... I was going to, I could not remember how they resolved the last one, but I guess the fact that we haven't, you haven't brought it up weekly since then means that we're good until the end of the fiscal year. So, all right. So yeah, they'll be uh, at that point, I guess, passing a, I don't know what else they can pass. Can they do anything other than the continuing resolution if there's no budget? I don't see how they possibly could. There can't be any more reconciliation. That's, well, I I say that, but then I forget that they might just declare that there could be. And what's well, the yeah, I mean, they didn't for doing include it? one with less spending bills. So, but right. uh, it, rules don't matter anymore, right? As as you pointed out, 
Fire the parliamentarians. I don't like it. <laughs> so in the middle of all of this, we have the rescissions fight, which reflects on the speaker fight, or mm. is may be the case the minor- minority leader fight. <laughs> right, hopefully. <laughs> with the Republicans in the House. Because Kevin McCarthy is the one pushing so hard with his buddy Trump, who has mm-hmm. all of his red and pink starbursts at hand, <laughs> um, to get this done. Mm-hmm. And McCarthy is also, of course, campaigning heavily to be the next Republican leader. So yes. how that all pans out, I have no idea. Whether anybody yeah. pays any attention to what Paul Ryan wants anymore, I have no idea. That it's, seems, no. Uh, it's just a whole nother layer of chaos on the House. So um, the, but yeah, and everybody, I guess, expects, or uh, the word is that Ryan favors McCarthy for the next Republican Oh, he leader. has said so. And, He's, okay, so I guess that would be the word, his word. Uh, but you can't and, trust that. And Scalise has mm. said, oh, of course I support McCarthy, but he's got all of the Freedom Caucus guys grumbling about that. But mm. at the same time, Jim Jordan, Freedom Caucus guy, says, well, I could do it. Oh, OK. I, you know, right now, I don't think anybody could get the votes. Because mm. uh, it is interesting now he's, he's running for the top Republican leadership spot. Uh, and pro rescissions, like working hard on the rescissions, which most the the bulk of the caucus says conference says I, I don't want anything to do with that, and it might even All be their the number rest one of no issue. Is saying the appropriations committees are saying I, 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 no yeah. ways and means no, <laughs> but please we can't do this. Yeah. But do it anyway, and then make me your leader. Uh, yeah, I, so it's a weird package he's offering. That's for sure. Uh, he has attached himself firmly to the coattails of Donald Trump. Oh, is that what he attached himself to firmly? <laughs> coattails. Hmm. Or, I know or it's back there it. somewhere. Whatever it was he's attached to, he's certainly trailing him <laughs> and bent over. So uh, we'll see what he's attached to. That's kind to. of an obsolete reference, isn't it? I probably shouldn't use that one anymore. But. Yeah, well, co- uh, coattails in general are yeah, pretty obsolete, I would guess. No one wore them to the state dinner, did they? I didn't see anybody in white tie and tails. And, and aren't they normally white tie events? Maybe not. Who knows? We, didn't, I, we I don't know. Um, they didn't let press in. Oh, I saw a lot of photos of or people arriving. Or any Democrats. <laughs> yes, that's right. I, I had forgotten to mention the fact that uh, they decided that this would be a partisan affair, which is really weird because why did we pay for it again? Yeah. I wonder if we can do that. Can we can we question the expenditure? He turned it into a political affair rather than a state affair, and maybe he should have to pay that out question of pocket. Question with who? Yeah, I don't know who to ask. Uh, yeah. And if they well, answer, I, they'll be fired. Um, so. The House of Representatives isn't going to particularly care. No, that's true. Why would I bother with that? Okay, that's true. So they'll just find that to be a, a frivolous inquiry. They got invited. Uh, all right. Well, I don't know. You're right. It's a, it is sort of a quiet day by comparison. There hasn't yeah. been a great deal happening. It's, it was today. really weird. Yesterday we were commenting on the fact that it was a slow news day. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was gearing but up for the dinner. Back to you know what what we would have been dealing with two years ago on April 24th. Um, mm. It would have been a wild day. Yeah, had there been no budget, certainly, that would have been one yeah. thing that would have been a problem. But I guess, he, you know, there was a dinner happening and, you know, he loves meals. And so he mostly stayed quiet and uh, and, and the Jackson um, I story, think I guess. Yesterday, he was really good on Twitter. Yeah. He was, was he... hardly there at all. I think we need Macklin to to hang around and be his his permanent babysitter. I guess so. He he accommodated him pretty well, I guess, and he kept him pretty calm. Uh, yeah, all right. Well, that's true. It was a pretty slow day. Oh, what we didn't get to was uh, the latest uh, setback for the president on DACA. 
But, uh, well, well, we'll have to get back to that and back on track with it on Thursday. But I, I did put together an interesting thread, I thought, of uh, probably a dozen or more times that uh, all of the stupid things that he declares unilaterally getting struck down by the courts one after the other. And DACA, the latest in that series. But, yeah, that's, uh, that's something that I guess we could have uh, rolled into the news roundup for the day. But we did not get a chance, I'm so sorry to say. It's Armando's fault. Yeah, largely true. Absolutely. Even Greg will agree with you there. Thanks, Joan, for <laughs> putting up with, <laughs> with everything and, uh, and for coming by, despite the fact that there wasn't a whole lot of news. It's always nice to hear from you and to, to chat over even a slow news day with you. And, All right. Uh, Thank you. We'll, Talk to you next we'll week. We'll do it next week and, uh, yeah, make sure that uh, we light a fire under these newsmakers. We have more exciting Absolutely. things to do. Probably, do something, people. Yeah, slow news day is a good news day. All right. Take care. Thanks very much, Joan. We hand you now over to Justice Putnam for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And you know how the story goes. I spend all of my sign-off time apologizing to Joan. <laughs> so we can't tell you. From Daily Coast Radio. On NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the K Grow in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Let's dig down deep into the preview for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy and grab a few stories down to the end. A new report from Betsy DeVos' own Department of Education exposes the destructive racism in American schools that Betsy De- DeVos supports. Plus, of course, the news of Mick Mulvaney and much, much more coming up next.